NFL draft season is here, and we are starting our draft coverage, a full month of it here on the Saints Insider Podcast. I'm Zach Ewing with Rod Walker, Luke Johnson, and Matthew Paris from our Saints Insider Studios. It is our first NFL draft show, and today we will be doing Mock Draft 1.0. Um, and so we'll get into that. We also have your rule change submissions from last week and uh, quite a bit more on today's episode. So let's get right into it. I want to let you know that this season's NFL draft coverage is brought to you by Tulane Doctors. Now at East Jefferson General Hospital, Tulane Doctors are bringing academic medicine to more patients in new communities. Look for the shield to know the future of medicine is here. Find your physician at TulaneDoctors.com or call 504-988-5000. Uh, new read, new year, new draft. Go Tulane. Can Heck Michael yeah. Pratt be the cure for the Saints? Oh, that and wow. More. <laughs> wow. He's always got one in his back pocket, folks. Well, t- today, today we're only focusing on the first round, so Michael <laughs> Pratt probably not the pick. We'll, we'll maybe talk to the Saints second round or two. Uh, as you all probably know, the Saints have picked number 14 in the first round. They picked number 45 in the second round. And then, barring any trades, they would not pick again until 150, I think. One fi- yeah, in the 150s. It's the end of the fifth round. Nothing in the third round, nothing in the fourth round, nothing until the end of the fifth round. Um, and the second round pick is not their own second round pick. That is the pick from the Broncos. Correct. Yeah, uh, from the Sean Payton deal. So, And they gave up their third round pick in that deal, I think. It was a swap. Yep. Um, interesting to, to kind of look at w- what happened to all of the Saints picks. That's maybe for another show. But um, <clears throat> let's dig into... Uh, First of all, before we get to the mock draft, we had something from last week where we asked you all for NFL rule changes, and we got what what I thought were some pretty fun submissions. So uh, I'm going to go through them real quick, one by one, and, and get quick reactions. Here's one from Dem Hudat Bay: Overtime, two point conversions only. Two options like penalty kicks; each team gets a chance, or the more progressive option, coin toss, and the winner decides whether to defend or take the ball. What say you? So it'd be actually overtime oh, okay. would just become a two point conversion. I'm okay with oh just a two point conversion. Yeah. I thought it meant you score you have to you'd have to go for two. Or you, or, or, no, they're saying, saying only two point conversions. So like the co- like pen, like penalty kick style. Okay, like like a, like no, the I college like uh, I think it's so once much, it gets to tri- the third overtime. Triple OT. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hmm. No, I don't. It seems not, it seems a little too gimmicky. I'm not I like the creativity. Now. I like the creativity, but I, I'm actually I, I love the college overtime format. Um, I think it would have to be amended with the. Uh, Moving back. NFL kickers being much better than college right. kickers. Um, but I actually really like that format, um, and I think I'd be in favor of something like that. Yeah, I like it too. I wish they hadn't gone to the third overtime just two-point conversion. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and we all have LSU and A&M to thank for yeah. that. I, I, I really want to talk to Eric McCoy about that game someday. And as if like a seven-overtime game once every ten years isn't fun. It's not like it happened all the time. I can tell you um, – as an LSU alumnus, uh, it was not fun for me. Well, as a copy editor on the Advocate Sports Desk that <laughs> night, it was not fun for me either. But it was still, you know, as a fan, I'd say, what's wrong with a 77-75 game every now and then? No, yeah, it's cool. It's so, cool. All right. Next one from Rosenfield10. He's got several. Carryover timeouts. So each team gets three. If, they, if you don't use them in the first half, you can carry them over. Theoretically, you could have six timeouts in the second half. I don't like it just because no, of all the breaks. No, that'd be dreadful. Yeah. Uh, oh, actually, maybe more time to write in the second half. That's <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> How thinking, does it affect thinking me? Thinking selfishly, yeah. <laughs> um, punt, kick, field goals. You can punt the ball through the uprights. Uh, what, for a touchback? Or? Yeah, for a field goal, for three points. Oh. Would anybody actually do that? Well, well, I think you, you, is it, it easy to do that? You'd be able to get it. Longer, still, yeah. It is still within the NFL rule book that you can drop kick a ball through the uprights, correct? But if you miss it, I think it's a touchback. Yeah. I kind of want to see it. I'm moving to that one. I think you could still drop kick a ball through the uprights. All right, just like a punt, except the ball hits the ground first. And he's also got one point kickoff score. If you kick the ball on a kickoff through the uprights, your team gets a point. This, this guy just wants to see more points. Yeah. You'd have to move the kickoff back. You'd have to at move least, it back. It's too, it'd be least. too easy. And you, and what that would be it'd be so entertaining, though, in a, like a tie game late in the fourth <laughs> quarter. His team just scored a touchdown and tied up with like 14 seconds left. And, and, like, and are you going to go for two, or are you just going to kick the extra point and then try to get the sign, kickoff? Te- yeah. Teams that have to sign a, a, a kicker who just has a big leg who's just there for uh-huh. that reason. A nine-point game would be a one-possession game. I mean, it would you not be true to the go for sport two and then, whatsoever, yeah. but like, I, uh, I love the creativity of these two. Dem Hudat Bay, another one. Get rid of the chains. On every first down, just move the ball to the nearest yard line and use the yard lines as the, as the markers for a first down. I kind of. I like think that. we have enough technology now where we don't have to 
We shouldn't be using shouldn't chains be using anyway. Chains anyway. Well, it's 2024, and we still got two dudes walking out with a. No. Uh, I, I was waiting for this one too. <laughs> this will be the last one. Jum Un Sun twenty seven ninety. I would allow all penalties to be challenged by the coaches or be reviewable. My man likes five hour games. I do think every time you get a challenge right, that you should. And I, I don't know. I'm, I may be getting my NBA and NFL rules mixed up, but whenever you get a challenge, right, I think you should. You should be not give another. You shouldn't yeah, lose. You them. shouldn't yeah. run out of challenges just because you got one right. 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 Yeah. And that's well. They tweaked it this year to where to get your first one right, you, you get, automatically have up to three now. If you keep yeah, getting them right, you should get them right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. If the refs, can you imagine up. though, if we had to like stop the game for every single holding call? Oh my god. <laughs> or, or I, I challenged that there was holding on that play, and then the old oh, adage that boy. there's holding on every god. every oh, yeah, NFL yeah. play. I mean, now that would give Matt time to write. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do think though, I do think there. The change in the rules to to re- make pass interference reviewable was a good change that would have stuck if the refs would have not just completely messed it up. Well, they just refused to ever change. It, it, which was it's yeah. so it's so bogus. Like that, that's such a huge game swing penalty. I mean, we saw it in the Packers Saints game this last year. Um, or yeah, I, I think you could have argued that they were pass interference uh, correct calls, but you're, you're talking about like forty yard penalties. If that's it changes. That's so much more impactful than like a, a ten yard holding call. Would you all change the the pass interference call to more like the college rule, where maybe it's not a fifteen yard max, but thinking, it's a twenty five yard max or something? I was, I was thinking about that. I I, I don't know. I I, I mean, because then you know you could have a DPI that's like within eight yards of the line of scrimmage, you're giving extra yards for it. Well, yeah, it's I, only up to right. If it's spot, either line of scrimmage up or to 15 yeah, yards up to, and even make it 25, so guys don't just drag people down on bombs in the end zone. I but I, I don't think, like, I don't, I don't necessarily think the games need to be uniform throughout. I, I kind of like that they have you know, each, each, the college and the NFL <laughs> and the CFL all have their own unique and and you know peculiarities to them. But um, I, yeah, I, I do think that. Like the refs shouldn't have just like strong armed the NFL into not making DPI reviewable because they're ready and willing to own up to their mistakes when they they mess up a fumble or you know a, a guy being out of bounds or inbounds and um, I don't know I'm surprised nobody brought up the the uh, fumble through the end zone we did last we, week. we did last week we Jeff weren't did. here Luke but yeah, yeah. that was Jeff's rule change uh, yeah I'm. I'm so against that rule. I, I remember like putting it out there uh, last year on Twitter and just getting roasted over the coals for it. People were like, well, you can't you, know, you got to penalize the team for losing the ball. It's like, well, you don't penalize them for losing the ball if they're on the thirty. Right, right. I, I would say you could make them lose the ball, but the other team gets it at the one instead of why are they also getting or twenty yards? A, make That's it a, the part like that a, doesn't. You know, bring it back to the twenty. You know, it, it, like you can make it a, a substantial penalty. You're losing twenty yards. And yeah, may loss it down or whatever it is, but. I mean, a complete loss of possession and giving the team 20 yards on top of it just feels ridiculous. Very punitive. Yeah. All right. Um, well, thank you for all your comments, and, and we will have giveaways during the draft, and you have to be a subscriber. Have, we're going to have to leave some comments. We'll come up with the exact rules for that probably for next week, but um, keep them coming. We like them. Moving to our mock draft. Uh, Luke, you put this together. It's on NOLA.com slash Saints today. The way that we did this particular mock draft is we let the computer, we let the almighty AI draft the first 13 picks. Courtesy of uh, Pro Football Focus. And then you stepped in and made the Saints pick at number 14. So what we're going to do is reveal the computer's picks. We're going to do three at a time just because that's what fit easily on the screen. And then we'll get to the Saints and we'll each give who we would pick in that situation. And, um, And then we'll reveal who Luke picked. Okay. And if you want more, you can read NOLA.com slash Saints. But uh, let's start with the top three picks. Probably no surprises here. Chicago Bears take Caleb Williams. We all know that. I don't even think you can bet on that anymore. It's like the betting markets are so – it's it's very clear it'll be Caleb Williams. Uh, in this case, probably also expected Jaden Daniels goes number two to Washington. Drake May goes number three to New England. Is that how you guys see this shaping out in real life? I think so. I think that's the uh... – I think that's kind of the prevailing winds leaning that way. Um, you know, there's a little bit out there about uh, maybe J.J. McCarthy slipping into the top three, and Drake May falling out of the top three. But um, and you know, maybe you could flip flop Jane Daniels and 
and Drake May, maybe a team trades up in the top three, but I think if, if it stays put, that's kind of the, the chalk right there. Uh, if only we had somebody here who knew the Washington Commanders who could tell us who the Commanders are more likely <laughs> to take at number two. Well, they don't have any idea either. It's, they've been pretty silent over there, and uh, it's even the – like I, I do expect them to stay in the spot. There was some talk of maybe they'd trade down, but after – you know, they traded Hal and they have Mariota, but you've got to find your franchise guy. But I, I think Daniels makes a lot of sense for them, just a little bit more modern. They, <laughs> This is kind of a lazy way to think about it, but they went with Sam Howell, UNC quarterback. Do they really want to take another UNC quarterback with Drake May? Ooh. I know Drake May is a lot better, but still, uh, I think Daniels makes a lot of sense for them. That's like a Jim Derry, Ohio State quarterbacks can never be good in the NFL take. Well, like, until C.J. Stroud, I probably would have uh, agreed with that. I, I See, I'm, I'm a Justin Fields defender. I think Justin Fields could still be, end up being good. Um, I don't really think that's an Ohio State thing. I think just I think it just goes to show how tough it is to be a good quarterback. But Yeah, I, I agree. I've heard people say the same thing. So, so I, I did find it interesting, um, Rod. We, we were at LSU's Pro Day last week, and I, I ran into a reporter from the Boston Globe, and they were also going to North Carolina's Pro Day the next day. So obviously it's sort of this May or Daniels question it to um Jaden Daniels to me is maybe the more exciting player he's he's obviously mobile uh very fast dynamic is Drake made a safer pick I, I it's hard I think I pick I'd definitely go with Jaden but I'm probably a little biased from being here and probably seeing him play more than I saw Drake may but I don't think you can really go wrong with either one of those guys but if I'm a fan of a team I think Jaden Daniels is the guy I would want my team to pick I don't okay. think May is the the safer pick at all. Um, he didn't produce in college. I think like his Daniels footwork did. is at least you know it seems like Daniels would be more of a day one starter than May is. I yeah, I, I think the the kind of thing with May is is he has like like all the prototype stuff, right? And you you can it, it's kind of like Justin Herbert a couple of years ago. He's coming out of Oregon. And he, you know, everybody was really high on him, but um, you know, the production wasn't always there at Oregon, and um, you, know, you kind of had to envision how this like six foot six megatron was gonna work in an nfl offense yeah. it turned out being really really good right away um it may is huge he has a big arm um but like you know he, he had some some issues in college where where he's not playing with with his his teammates weren't like up to his caliber you know, his offensive line play was really poor um and he'd try to play some hero ball sometimes and and try to make some throws that really didn't make sense in the moment so if you just get him in the in the right program and the right coaching, you know he's got every single tool that you want in a quarterback. Whereas Jane Daniels is more of the the modern NFL quarterback, the the athlete. But you know the the questions come with him with with size. It was really just you know the one year of the big production, um, and you know it's kind of like choose your flavor. But I I don't think May is by any stretch a, a safe pick. It's you're, you're betting on the traits. Pretty likely in any case that those are your top three in some order. Like you said, J.J. McCarthy's getting some buzz. Maybe we see a wide receiver pop up, but probably those three are your top three picks. So let's move on to the next three, and we'll move the first, you know, we'll move previous picks over to the left side of the screen here. At four, the Arizona Cardinals take Marvin Harrison Jr. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Some buzz from Malik Neighbors as wide receiver one, but Harrison maybe more likely at number five, the chargers take the first offensive tackle off the board. That's Joe Alt of Notre Dame. And then at number six is the New York giants. And they take JJ McCarthy um, ending presumably the Danny dimes era in, uh, in New Jersey. So we have Harrison Alt and McCarthy off the board here. Any, any surprises for you, Matt? Yeah, I think McCarthy, I, I, you know, Arizona traded back last year and then I traded up again. I, I think that four is maybe for sale, even five, you know, Harbaugh coming in here. I, I think, you know, you look at a team like the Vikings, maybe the Raiders. I, th I think someone will jump up probably for McCarthy in that spot, or especially if May were to fall, you know, I, I'd watch that four or five pick. But given what we have on the board, yeah, I, I think those picks make a lot of sense. The, the McCarthy one to the Giants is a little interesting. I, I don't think – I think even if they were to draft – a quarterback there yeah, I think Daniel Jones would still be the starter at least for some of 2024 to but. start yeah Luke did they were trades an option in this pro football focus uh they were um the computer didn't do any trades with him but but uh they were offered to me and I, I just made it a uh 
like just right. a, a staple that I was going to decline everything because like I, I wouldn't want to do a mock draft and be like yeah I, I took the <laughs> I took the Chargers right. 2025 first you know so yeah. no no pick for the Saints this year yeah it just, <laughs> All right. uh, so it just doesn't make for a good headline yeah it's part yeah. of my rules to just yeah. decline every every trade even though some of them were Same with Mickey Lewis. very enticing I want to ask you about those trades at the end what maybe what was offered but um I don't know I Rod I should have this in front of me and I don't I don't know the last draft that went six picks without a trade doesn't seem likely to happen this year. There, somebody will jump up, as Matt said. Yeah, I mean, just a lot of good players. The thing that surprised me about this list is, well, Marvin Harrison was what? He was Five, fourth. Fourth. Four. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this time a year ago, I mean, we probably thought he was probably two, right? Yeah, top three anyway. baby. Yeah. And hey, I mean, this time saying, a year ago, Gene Daniels is like a day three pick. Right, that's what I'm saying. So, I mean, just the fact that Marvin Harrison is, you know, down to four kind of tells you a lot about this draft and how well the quarterbacks kind of just leap to the forefront. Chargers take Joe Alt, and that's the first tackle. The, the interesting thing is the Chargers could also use a wide receiver. Um, they're one of the teams up there that doesn't need a quarterback. But the nice thing for the Saints is that almost everybody in the top ten either needs a quarterback or a receiver. And um, and so that means those positions are going to get taken in the tackles. I don't think Joe Alt will fall to the Saints, but um, I don't think a lot get taken in the top ten. Yeah, well, I think the Chargers are kind of the wild card. If if And I think it was at the owners' meetings that uh, – Jim Harbaugh um, just kind of went on about how look at the the only position that is that that is completely independent of every other position on the on the team, and that every other position on the team depends upon is the offensive line, um, and it's true. Uh, if you have a really good offensive line, it, it will it will raise every other facet of your offense. If you have a bad offensive line. Like we saw last year with the Saints, bad offensive line play. Their quarterback play suffered, um, and by extension, their receiver play suffered. Their ground game was atrocious all year last year. Um, it's it's the bedrock of an offensive success. So it would not surprise me at all if they went out and got Joe Alt and paired him with Rashawn Slater and have two really good foundational offensive tackles. Um, would not surprise me if they traded out of it. Um, you know, somebody looking to get a quarterback. Uh, Denver Broncos or Minnesota Vikings who got the extra first round pick to go make uh, prob- presumably go get a quarterback. Um, there's a lot of different ways it can go, but if they take one there, you know, and this next group of picks, you know, Tennessee Titans have been linked to offensive linemen this entire draft cycle. You could have two off the board in the first seven, and then, and then that starts to kind of thin the pool, and maybe teams who are considering an offensive lineman feel like, oh, well, we need to go get one now. I just think yeah. that's that that could be kind of like a little little pivot point in this draft. Yeah, for sure. All right, we'll move on to the next three picks, and uh, including the Saints' first divisional opponent in here, the Titans at seven. As you mentioned in this mock, they take Malik Neighbors out of LSU. They go for a wide receiver. The Falcons go for another receiver, the the third of the big three, Roma Dunze of Washington. So now you've got a Dunze with Drake London, with B. John Robinson, with Kyle Pitts. All these weapons for Kirk Cousins and, and a what was pretty good offensive line most of the year last year, I think. Uh, and then ninth, the Bears with their second pick take Jared Verse, the edge rusher out of Florida State. So uh, first of all, Roma Dunze for the Falcons. How do you guys like that? Makes th- a l- yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, they've spent from the moment that Kirk Cousins got there, they've spent a lot of their offseason trying to upgrade the weapons around him. They brought in Daryl Mooney from the Bears. Send another receiver who I'm blanking on right now, but I know they've added more than one receiver at the position. Um, you know, Kirk can spread it out. It's really trying to maximize that window, even though he's coming off a torn Achilles. You don't know how much Kirk Cousins has left. It's really about trying to. I mean, we saw we're recording this on the day that the Texans traded uh, for Stephon Diggs mm-hmm. and the Bills, and, and you know their situation is a little bit different because they have a rookie. A quarterback on the scale so where they can take advantage of the cap but it's still that similar philosophy of all right we have our guy in place let's go get it and I think that's what the Falcons are trying to do I think if you're a Bears fan you're excited about this draft if you get if you get Jared Verse and you get Caleb Williams but to me I think the Falcons man if, I, if I'm the Falcons I think I get Jared Verse at that pick if he's available but that's just you know just to kind of show up the defense I think with the people the Falcons have already brought in I think they are I think they're I think they have some good weapons on offense already, so that's just how yeah. that's the way I would play it if I was them. But I I personally love Roma Dunze. I think he's one of my like top three favorite players in this draft class. Um, I think he's going to be a stud. Uh, but like the Falcons, 
have not had a a good pass rusher in a long time. Um, and I, I frankly, if it were me, and, and I know I'm not the only one out here, it, it, basically every single mock draft I've seen has linked them to Dallas Turner. Um, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, you know, I think he'd be. I think it, I would be personally surprised if he's not the first defender taken. I, I think Jared Verse is a good ball player, but um, Dallas Turner, I think, is is probably this draft's premier pass rusher. Um, so that that would be, like, if I were making this pick for the Falcons, I would have taken Dallas Turner for them. No questions about it. Even even though I'm, I love Roma Dunze, I think he'd be awesome in that offense. Then we have Malik Neighbors to Tennessee, which um, maybe wouldn't be Neighbors' first choice. Of where he would go, but I, the, the Titans certainly. Need, you mentioned they need offensive linemen; they need weapons on the outside too. I mean, I don't know, man. If if you're a speedy wide receiver uh, and you got Will Levis throwing you the ball, I mean, he's he's willing to th- go throw it up there That's and make, let you make some plays. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to that. Um, you know, LSU receivers have made big plays in Brian Callahan's offense before, so it's true. It has happened, yeah. All right, uh, next three picks. Now, So now we're through nine picks, and the Saints, at this point in the draft, you're five picks away. You start to look at who's out there and who's possible. We still have Dallas Turner on the board. Still have um, Brock Bowers, the tight end, on the board. Every offensive lineman except for Joe Alt is on the board. Uh, Brian Thomas is out there. I, I think at this point, and, and nothing that's happened so far is shocking or unlikely, the Saints probably feel pretty good about where they're at right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and this is exactly, I, I think this is why, you know, barring some really unforeseen thing happening, like Joe Alt sliding out of the top 10, um, I, I think this is really a year where it'd be kind of hard pressed to see the Saints trade up because um, I think there's going to be good options there at 14. Um, but good options specifically at like the positions where they need to address. Um, and they don't have, I mean, they don't have much draft capital at all this year. Um, and you know, we know they're not afraid to trade future draft assets to go get a guy they like, but, um, at some point they're going to have to start stocking their player or their, their roster with cheap young talent. Um, so yeah, I think this is falling exactly the way that many of us are expecting and, and kind of probably other saints are hoping. All right. So 10, uh, in this mock draft, Talise Fuaga of Oregon state goes to the jets. That's the second offensive lineman off the board. Number 11 is Dallas Turner. The Vikings are very happy to get him at 11. And then number 12, uh, is it Terry and Arnold, the cornerback from Alabama, yeah. going to Sean Payton's Denver Broncos at 12. Um, again, probably th- obviously if Dallas Turner is there, the Saints would have to consider him. But three picks that I don't think the Saints are they, – they felt like they got a sniper here and, and like got somebody they really wanted taken in front of them. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're still in good shape right now with, with – but two picks away from, from where they are. So um, some really good tackles on the board that we'll get to, I guess, here shortly. And so, yeah, I, th- I think they like where they are right now. Yeah, Talise Fuaga of Oregon State. Talk to me about him. What what differentiates him from the other linemen? Why would he be the second tackle taken? I mean, I think we've seen a lot of uh, kind of positive buzz about him. His, his stock's kind of risen as the, uh, as the draft season has progressed. Um, I think he's one of those guys who a lot of teams view as somebody who's going to come in and contribute right away. The question is, where is he going to contribute? I think, um, if my memory serves correctly, he, he was uh, strictly a right tackle, or he played some he played some guard in college as yeah. well. Um, and, and kind of the idea about him is that maybe he comes in as a guard right away, but he's somebody that projects as a tackle in the future. Um, but to me, uh, yeah. I think he's a really good player, and obviously the Saints have needs at both tackle spots, so if he's there for them, for sure, I'd consider him as an option. Uh, he he kind of checks the boxes. He's, he's tall enough. He's long enough. Um, he's got the athletic score. Uh, but, yeah, he's still, to me, more of a right tackle kind of guy. And if you're the Saints and you got holes at both tackle positions, I think you still got to try to find a left tackle uh, because – yeah, those spots are more valuable, it, and the NFL says they're more valuable. It's it, the blind side. Yeah, it's it's yeah. the blind side. Those guys make more money, um, and you know they, I think that's that's you've got to. There are degrees of premium positions. You know, like a slot receiver is not as valuable as an outside X receiver. Um, you know, a, a left tackle is more valuable than a right tackle. 
a, a high sack produ- producer as an edge rusher is more valuable than a than kind of a three down defensive end. I, I, I just think that um, if it were me and my options were Fuaga and, and somebody who maybe profiles more as a left tackle, I would, I would lean toward the latter. Right. Though I think for the Jets, you know, you look at they signed Tyron Smith. Yep. But they have the left tackle there. They've had so many injuries on the offensive line where for Fuaga, I think that versatility is actually probably a benefit for them in their specific situation because, you know, they have Elijah Vera Tucker a few years ago. He's kind of that same guy, right, in terms of was a right guard, thinking kick out to tackle. I think having two of those type of guys, that there are injuries. Um, they're in a position to withstand them a lot better now. And that, it makes more sense to go kind of on the right side of the line for them anyway. Whereas for the Saints, yeah, left tackle, left tackle, left tackle. I, th- I think the the Jets have gotten two tackles in free agency this offseason, right? They got Tyron Smith. And it was oh, right. Dwayne, right. Dwayne oh, Starks. They traded for Morgan Marzis. That's right. That's right. Um, Former commander. <laughs> drink. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I, I mean, they've they've addressed their tackle position. So, like, a, a lot of people had, you know, before free agency, had them kind of zeroing in on a tackle. And it's kind of like the Saints with pass rusher where – you know, we're kind of like maybe not a pass rusher in the first round is as, 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 as much of a dire need now because they signed Chase Young. Uh, so maybe that's the case with the Jets. But I think, you know, Tyron Smith has been injured much of the last oh, yeah. four seasons. And, um, and you know, the injuries that they've, they've sustained on the, on the line, I, I think it's, it's a place where you always have to invest. Saints can tell you, as well as anybody, you have to have depth on that yes. offensive line. Uh, you're watching the Saints Insider podcast for Wednesday, April the 3rd. And we're going through our first NFL mock draft. Uh, we are going to two shows a week all the way through draft season. So we'll be back with you on Friday with another episode. I uh, want to let you know that the Saints Insider Podcast draft coverage is sponsored by Tulane Doctors. So we appreciate them. And uh, also hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, sign up for notifications. Uh, you get get all that stuff good when we go live. We've got some pro day videos up from LSU and Tulane as well. So all your draft coverage right here on the Saints on NOLA.com YouTube channel. Um, okay, situation is this. Saints are now one pick away. The Las Vegas Raiders have the 13th pick in the draft. At this point, only two tackles have been taken. So if the Saints want to tackle, clearly they're going to at least get a top four guy. Um, you have J.C. Latham out there. You have Olu Fashno out there. Um, you have Amarius Mims, some of the other tackles who, you know, maybe people thought were going to go lower, but if you're the Saints and you really like one, you got to take them at 14. Um, Pretty good spot. Is this a situation, guys, where if the Saints have a guy they really want, they worry about the Raiders taking him and they might try to swap spots with him? I mean, I think you got to worry about anything with the Raiders. <laughs> the Raiders uh, do need offensive uh, line yeah, as well. Yeah, so. yeah. They, they do. Uh, and But they, they're they such a notoriously difficult team to peg what they're thinking, you know? Um, I, they've, if they're thinking. Well, I don't want to be mean. <laughs> but but they, they've, I mean, they have like just a crazy draft history. Taking people you never expect. The what was it? The twenty twenty draft. It was loaded with wide receivers, and they took Henry Ruggs. It was the first receiver off the board, and they took him. Yeah. Um, they they reached on Cleveland Farrell. I think it was a top five pick. Um, <coughs> yeah, it, it can go way back in the day when they took Darius Hayward Bay. I think top ten pick because he ran a super fast forty. Um, they're like impossible to predict come draft time. So like I wouldn't want to be like trying to get inside their heads if I was the Saints. So, I wouldn't be worried because no, I mean, that was your question. Like, would you be worried about what they're gonna do? I mean I would <laughs> just because of the depth that the position that the Saints need, I think whatever the Raiders do, you're yeah, you're fine with it. And and in this case, Matt Latham and Fashionu are both out there. I, I think pretty clearly the top two offensive tackles left at this spot. Um you know, you could argue for other guys, but maybe it's just a situation of if the Raiders take one of them, you take the other. Yeah, I mean, for Latham, he's more of a right tackle. He said he'd be at the combine. He'd want to play left, you know, was eager to kind of show teams he could do that. But, you know, we haven't really hit on Ryan Ramchuk's injury here. Uh, sounds a lot more pessimistic after the owners' meetings of just, I know you guys hit on it in the pod last week, but... um don't know if he's going to be available, so I think you kind of have to start planning for your right tackle of the future. But at the same time, if he's ready to go, then you're wasting kind of a first-round pick. But you could also try him on left. So I, I don't think Latham is a terrible option, but I'd rather go to um, Fashionu if he's there. Man, I, I just the Trevor Penning 
Ryan Ramchick, Andres Pete, all these guys who are like, oh, they could fit at tackle or they could fit at guard or you could move them around. Right. Not that it's a bad thing to be able to move around, but I think the Saints want, to your point, Luke, earlier, they want a left tackle, a plug-and-play left tackle. That would be my selection, yes. All right, so the Raiders in this mock take J.C. Latham from Alabama, and I think that probably plays into the Saints' hands, but we'll pause for a second and ask, go around the room. Okay, so here the Saints are at number 14. Olu Fashnu is out there. Um, the other tackle whose name starts with F, and I'm messing them all up. Uh, Troy Fatanu. Fatanu, yeah. Fatanu, Fatanu from Fa- Washington. Fashnu and Fuaga are all ta- left uh, no, tackles. Fu- yeah, yeah, that's right. Fuaga's already taken. So there's, uh, there's uh, Fashnu, uh, Fatanu from Washington. Uh, there's still Marius there. Mims out there from Georgia who's mm-hmm. uh, – you like J.C. Latham, big, huge, super athlete um, who's strictly played on the right side. And on the pass catcher side, you saw Brian Thomas from LSU, and you saw Brock Bowers, the tight end from Georgia. Um, Defense-wise, I'm trying to think of the edge rushers. Who Liatu are, Latu. Um, yeah, from UCLA. And, I mean, honestly, that's about that's about all I'd, I'd consider defensively at that point. Um, there's Chop Robinson, but yeah, it yeah, seems a little early for him. It does. I, and, and, just, and he's smaller. But, right. Yeah. It, they'd have to really, really, really be in love with him um, just because he's he goes against all of their usual stuff. He also feels like a guy that if you really wanted to, you could pop down to 18 and still get him and pick up an extra pick somewhere. Not that the Saints ever do that, but... Before we make our picks, is this a spot you would consider trading down if you're the Saints, given the situation? No, um, I would not, because uh, the guy who I'm planning on taking is uh, really, really high on my board, <laughs> and I would want to get him. And I, yeah, I, I don't think I would have considered trading up for him just because of their their asset problem. But um, I'm very happy that he's here. So no, I'm not considering trading down. Matt, I agree. Rod, I agree. All I right. think we should all just say our pick at the same time. Just <laughs> one <laughs> chaos. Yeah. All one, three we all go in the same. We can do like quartet style. I don't know who's going to be the <laughs> Rod. Why don't you go first? Who are you taking at fourteen? Fashion. I'm taking <laughs> <laughs> Olu Fashionu from Penn State. All right. I just it's there was a big square hole. I mean, yeah, I mean there was a need. This guy fits the need. You have to pick him right here. I don't. If they picked anybody else, I'd actually be shocked. If the if the draft plays out like this, I just. I just don't see how they could go any other way. All right. Luke, you were the one who wrote the story. I don't think you can change it's your mind It's a little fashion. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I mean, this guy is like the perfect Saints player. He's 6'6", 312. The average Saints offensive tackle drafted under Jeff Ireland is 6'6", 314. Uh, he had a 9.61 relative athletic score. Uh, the two guys who played tackle who've been drafted by Jeff Ireland who had an RAS – or like 9.55. Um, he's a team captain. The Saints love team captains. He was productive. He was he has all the accolades. Um, you know, he was a, um, a unanimous first team All American last year. He was the Big Ten Offensive Lineman of the Year. The guy can flat out play. Um, there are some some concerns about his his run blocking being kind of behind him, him, him as a pass blocker, but I, I, don't, I don't think the Saints care about that because the traits are so good. He's got a huge wingspan. He's got long arms, um, all of which align like almost perfectly with, with the average offensive tackle drafted by Jeff Ireland. Um, he's like an, such an obvious player at a, an extreme position of need um, that like you just – as much as I love Brock Bowers and I, I, I love the idea of of getting like a George Kittle clone for this offense, um, like this just aligns so perfectly that Olu Fashano has to be the pick for me. Matt, S- same here. I, I think I've been thinking a lot lately about like you know Trevor Penning was supposed to be the slam dunk kind of pick coming out of the draft as well, but I, I just think Fashano is more technically sound. Uh, than Penning was coming out, and that that's the big plus for me. You know, you you read scouting bios of um, Fashionu. The, the the thing that stands out is he didn't allow a sack at Penn State. That's kind of the big sticking point, at least according to Pro Football Focus. And you know, he he's so sound as a pass blocker. He's not a, not necessarily overly aggressive in, in the way that Penning was. I, I think you know that's kind of what's 
At least that's what Daniel Jeremiah was saying. That's kind of what's gotten Penning into trouble at the next level. He's faced a higher level of competition coming out. And so I think some of those concerns that maybe you had with Penning looking back shouldn't be a problem here. I would pick the tackle. That was one, I was going to also add that the fact he's just played in the Big Ten. I mean, he's definitely – he should, should be, be more as ready to go as, as a you could possibly can be. be. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, and and, and kind of to that point, like I think if you're looking at the two players we were just talking about a, a second ago, and J.C. Latham and Olu uh, Fashionu, I think Latham profiles a lot closer to Penning, right? Where where you, you're looking at him as he's more advanced as a run blocker. He's super aggressive. He's a big, huge body um, who who wins with power. Uh, where I, whereas I think. Fashion is kind of more of your prototypical mold left tackle where he's he's longer, he's leaner, um, maybe a bit more athletic and and maybe a bit more based on technique um, versus just like I'm going to outman you at the at the point of attack. So I really think that like if he's there, like he has to be the pick unless unless Joe Alt's available. I think Joe Alt's kind of like a, just a, a notch above Fashion. But it, when you're looking at this class, there's like two no doubt plug and play left tackles it was joe alt and olu fashion and I, I think everybody beyond that is there's question marks about where they fit uh, uh this might be the first mock draft in the history of podcasts where the entire panel agrees on the same on the player because it just doesn't i mean outside of like when you're picking number one or number two it's just not that common but a need a player there a top two player at his position if you're just considering strictly left tackles it's joe alt and him I think the Saints have to do it. Uh, just just to spice things up a little bit, if let's say Alt and Fashion are both off the board, they go in the top 12, um, are you still going tackle here with Latham or with um, Fatani or somebody else? Or, or at that point, would Brock Bowers become more of a temptation for you? He's definitely a temptation. I mean, I think he's going to be a Hall of Fame tight end, but I just think the need at tackle this year is just so big with the uncertainty around, you know, ramp check and – Penning's de- development, and we don't know about Pete. So I think you still have to go tackle regardless. And if you're afraid that's going to happen, maybe that means you have to pop up to 12 and get Vash uh, I, I mean, maybe. It, it's definitely a legit possibility he's not there. Um, I think I, I'd personally be okay with Latham. Um, there are definitely some question marks there, but uh, but I, I think the, there's there's potential that, that he's the best offensive lineman in the class. Um, yeah, the guy was like a – consensus five-star coming out of high school he didn't even start playing offensive line until his junior year of high school um you know he's he's got the the size and the movement ability um but i mean i i think if it were down between him and bowers it would be a, a bit more of a discussion for me i, I think that you, you have to you have to address your needs and you have to do it through the draft but i, I think that you know, when you're faced with, we, we feel pretty good about this guy and we feel like this guy is going to be like a high-level playmaker for us for a long time. Um, and, and you have, as Jeff Ireland likes to say, conviction about a certain player and how he's going to fit within what you do. Um, I, like, I, I don't think you can look at this through a, through a right now, this year sort of lens all the time. I, I, I think you can if, if you are, you know, if, if Fashanu or Fashion is there and you're like, oh, yeah, he fits what we need, and we really love him as a player, and he and he does everything we want him to do. Um, but like, if maybe you have a eight time Pro Bowler waiting for you there, who you know fits your style of offense, Brock Bowers averaged eight point seven yards after the catch last year in college. Um, then you you go, okay, look, this guy's gonna be a superstar. Let's get him, and we'll figure tackle out in that, a short. See, time. I think that's where I'm at. I. Man, I don't know about you. I think I, if if Alt and Fashion are both off the board, I'm I think the temptation of of Bowers becomes so great that I I don't know that I could pass it up. Yeah, I'm trying not to. Kyle Pitts not being the superstar that everyone thought he was, and even T.J. Hawkinson to a degree, at least with the Lions, like just conceptually drafting a tight end that high makes me a little nervous. And I know Bowers is really great. But I just I don't know like I, I just kind of want to see it. Whereas a tackle I'd feel safer with. And if I was going on like another position outside that, I mean I think Brian Thomas. I've kind of you were more on this originally than 
maybe a few weeks ago when we last talked about this, but I've kind of warmed up to that as well. I mean, he's a very exciting player, and From, they're going to add a pass catcher. I think actually maybe Brian Thomas would be like the the more interesting option than Bowers personally, but I don't know. Maybe that's crazy. <laughs> From a future of the stand of the franchise standpoint, I, I mean, I could understand the, the Brock Bowers pick, but I think if you're Dennis Allen on such a yeah, that's, that's a true. Short lease yeah. now, like man, like I just don't, I don't know if you could take that risk of not getting a tackle. Yeah, so. yeah, you might be uh, delivering the right the, to the great talent to somebody else. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, we we're not going to go through the rest of the first round here, but if you do want to see how the computer mocked the rest of the first round. Check out Luke's story published this morning on NOAA.com slash Saints. Um, but let's talk quickly about the Saints second rounder. Obviously, again, their only other pick in the top 150 of the draft is at number 45. If they do indeed get Fashionu with that number 14 pick, what are you guys looking for in this second round pick? Another uh, Matt, you wrote about this last week, could be another offensive tackle. Your depth situation is so bad at that position that maybe you spend both picks on that. Could be a wide receiver, a pass catcher. Could also be a defensive lineman or an edge rusher. Um, what are y'all looking at? Obviously, it depends a little bit on who's available. But in an ideal world, who would you like to get in that second second round? Based on the mock draft or just period, just position Yeah, I mean, j- just because we're not going through every okay, pick, okay. let's just say. No, I, I think you're still – I just, that depth on the line is like a really big concern for me. So I'm, if there's a guy out there in that second round that you can get to, you know, maybe a more versatile guy that can play tackle, both both tackles or guard, I think I'm probably still trying to build at that offensive line because I'm just concerned about it. Now, if they think Trevor Penning is going to pan out, then maybe you can kind of, you know, drift off to and maybe get an interior defensive lineman. But um, I think offensive lineman for me is still – what I would be going at. And I know fans won't be happy with the Saints using two picks for an offensive line. but I think, I think they, will, they will be yeah. if they, they open up a bunch of holes in the run game and protect the quarterback. And we talked last yeah. year about how many weapons the Saints had and how this offense yeah, could I be pretty good. That, yeah. And it, it just it was okay, but it, it wasn't as good as it could be because of the offensive line. You want to let those weapons kind of breathe and, and do their thing. Matt, I think you came away from Orlando thinking this was more of a possibility than before. Yeah, I mean, just with Ramchek, the, just the, the 180 that Dennis right. Allen did – was, oh, he's doing great, and then just, oh, we'll have to see. It was very kind of ominous. Uh, the interesting thing about taking tackles back-to-back, one, it doesn't really happen that often. I think since 2000, there have been 11 instances of teams just going back-to-back, let alone like back-to-back tackles, let alone like the first two picks in your draft going tackle back-to-back. Uh, the Bengals did it in 2015. I think the Colts did it in 2011. It hasn't really always worked out in that situation i can't remember who the Bengals picked off the top of my head in 2015 but you know it wasn't as great we have our two tackles of the future we're set it you know that it's the case with any draft you know you're, you're it's more of a crapshoot but i think I, just where the saints are I, I actually think trying to find a right tackle makes sense but if they don't go there then you mentioned defensive tackle. I, I actually maybe would rather go an edge rusher, at least there. But I, I actually think receiver makes a lot of sense as well. I know that's what Luke yeah, had. Yeah, and Lu- Luke, in your mock draft, again, without going over every player who is available, you ended up going with Jermaine Burton, Alabama wide receiver. Yes, uh, and I was really ticked that Keon Coleman of Florida State wasn't there. Uh, he ended up being the first uh, the first receiver taken in the or first player taken in the second round in the mock draft I did. Um, if if the Saints could get out of this this whole draft scenario and have Olu Fashnu and Keon Coleman as their first two picks, I think they would be like ecstatic. You know, I, I think there's there's a legitimate chance that Coleman's there in the second round. I, I think we've seen um, you know some some kind of hyped receivers uh, fall in recent years, even, even though the, the position's taken on some prominence because teams value different types of receivers. And somebody might not want the six four guy who's running the four six at the combine uh, for their offense. Maybe they want somebody like Xavier Worthy, who's you know this, the burner, or you know, Malachi Corley, who's the yard after catch guy. Uh, Keon Coleman, for me, I, I think it's perfectly matched for what the Saints want out of their receivers. They want a big guy who can move the chains and and you know, yeah. make some contested circus catches. And Burton is not more. That. In- yeah, more in the Xavier right. Worthy mold. Yeah. Right. And so I, I took Burton mainly because I think he's going to be a really, really fun player. And I, I think 
you know, maybe you're not getting uh, somebody who's going to push Chris Olave to be the the wide receiver one. And and you know, I did have some some concerns about it because he's he's a very similar player to Olave and Shahid. He's basically the same size as those guys, about six foot, 190 pounds. Um, you know, most of his production in college came on vertical routes where he's using his speed. Um, you know, I think he was a sub four four guy at the combine. Um, but like, man, it, it, just think about. <laughs> about being a defense trying to trying to guard three guys on the field who who all create space with their speed yeah um you know you, you've seen what teams do when they just load up on speed uh, look at the miami dolphins what they do with jalen waddle and tyree kill and raheem mostert and devon a chain just speed track guys all over the field and they they change the geometry of the field um, so uh, yeah, I think that if you can get another guy like if you're not going to get the the big bodied wide receiver, um, I think getting another guy like that uh, to uh, just really put stress on the defense vertically, horizontally, all over the place um, would be the way I'd want to go. I also considered uh, Florida State defensive tackle Braden Fisk. There, he's another guy that really yeah, just kind of fits what the Saints look for traits wise, um, and had, another spot where they need depth. Yeah, yeah. had a huge combine. Um, you know, putting him next to Brian Brzee would be two super athletes at that position. Um, and, you know, he had a big year production-wise at, at Florida State after transferring. Um, yeah, that, I mean, there's so many different ways they can go in the second round, uh, but it really, you know, just kind of depends on what, what the flavor of player the teams are looking for before then. I actually think, you know, we talked about whether it would be worth trading up in round one. Maybe round two is actually maybe where, because they have that gap. If there is a run of receivers there, maybe you try and get out ahead of it. They have all those fifth rounders that they could maybe package some of them. Maybe you're willing to dip into, you know, your 25 assets, throw them a third. Like, um, just talking to my buddy Ben Sandick at The Athletic, and in his latest mock draft, he proposed actually Washington trading back with New Orleans. New Orleans would jump up to 40 hmm. and grab a receiver there. A lot less stuff. expensive yeah. to do that in the second round, too. The first round, very expensive, even, yeah. even yes. to move up two, two or three spots. Yeah, you look at the draft trade value charts. Once you get past the first round, the, the points start going, you know, yeah. diminishing between picks. Um, this is kind of something I was thinking about when Matt was talking about drafting back-to-back tackles. I think the thing that hurts the Saints' chances and, and really limits what they can do in this draft is that they don't have third- and fourth-round picks. Yeah. Uh, it, it really stresses the importance of those first two because it's it's going to be really really hard to acquire other ones without you know, to give up a or to get a 2023 third you might have to give up a 2024 second i do i do man you talk about dennis allen and being on the hot seat and needing to win right now maybe there's some checks and balances maybe mickey loomis feels like his job is safer and says i'm we're not doing that but it does feel like they might be more likely to say yeah 2025, 2026, if we need to spend those picks to get more picks this year, we'll do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I just think this this year is just so urgent that they, they almost have to do that. They got to make sure they yeah. and it's, nail been, these first two picks. They've been pretty, you know, like they went about free agency not trying to go all in again. Right. They We saw them take actually a little bit more of like a, a conservative approach just in the way they did their contracts. And they, you know, Chase Young would, was their big spend, but he was still relatively affordable. It seems like they're trying to get back to normal, and I don't know if going all in in the draft would mesh with that other approach. I don't but, know if but I think like they go, getting no, back right. to normal in the cap and and yeah, like sure. and using your draft assets, I think are two different different things. And the Saints have just been <clears throat> just perennially willing to dip into their. Their have pile they, of picks in twenty five and twenty six. To have they ever had a full complement of draft picks? Like, when I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure they. Have. It's, it's probably happened sometime. Uh, all right, we're kind of into our takeaways anyway. But you're watching the Saints Insider first mock draft of draft season, um, and so let's do a final takeaway here. Uh, Rod, what's the headline of your column on <laughs> on? Um, well, I guess it would be Saturday morning if the Saints' first two picks end up being <laughs> Olu Fashionu and Jermaine Burton. And Jermaine Burton. <laughs> Uh, I'm probably um, Saints feel need, Saints feel desperate need, and I don't know. I'm not <laughs> as sold on the burden pick as as okay. Luke is. I just don't know if he's so. Maybe the Friday headline would be Friday, more positive yeah, than yeah, the Saturday yeah, was, headline. Yeah. Um, 
But but yeah, I mean, obviously, I think any draft in which they get Fashionu is a success. Can we say that at least at the yeah. top? Yeah, because I think this is a team that doesn't feel like they have a a lot of holes. I think, and I know I keep saying the same thing, but I mean, I just feel like if you feel that tackle position, I think you've kind of hit a home run, especially with as deep as this draft is at that position. So I don't think they can, I don't think they can mess this one up. How about you guys? Obviously, a lot of variables here, but if you come away with Fashionu and um, and and then a receiver in the second round, Burton, for instance, how how are you feeling for the Saints? Well, I made the picks. Obviously, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> um, if you nail the two picks, then you get, you get to brag about that for a whole year. So if I nail the two picks in the first mock draft, yeah, um, yeah, no, I I think I think that's that's kind of what we're expecting, right? Um, and the Saints have done a lot of, you know, outside of it, that's how in the last couple of years, at least, they've done a lot of what we've expected them to do in the draft. I think just about all of us had Brian Brzee last year. Um, you know, uh, you know, they they added players at positions we expect them to take, and and there's two pretty obvious things that they've talked about all off season. You need help at tackle, and you need help at pass catcher. Um, they've addressed the pass rusher thing, so I, I mean, I, I think that's it would just be expected if that's the the route they go. Even if they flip flop them, even if they they decide to wait into the second round, which I think would be a risky proposition. You don't know who's going to be there. There's a lot of teams at the back half of the first round who could use offensive line help. Um, if they're able to get you know, somebody who who could potentially step in and, and play a starting role on the on the the offensive tackle at, in the second round, I think you know, you'd have to be pretty happy with what they do. Yeah, certainly, Matt. I mean, I don't think there's any tough questions to ask about why the Saints would go this way if they end up taking offensive tackle receiver. Yeah, I mean, just the way that free agency has played out, tackle's the most obvious. It's the one big hole left for New Orleans, and they are waiting to the draft to fill it. I mean, it's really their only option at this point, unless they strike out in the draft and bring back Andres Pete. But, boy, that would <laughs> talk about upsetting fan base. Mm. <laughs> that would be a disappointing outcome, I think. And I like Pete. I think he played well, but... You're, you're really putting all your eggs in the, the draft basket, I think. He can't, he can't be playing A at this point. No. So, all right, Saints Insider Mock Draft, we're wrapping it up. Uh, went a little bit longer than usual. We appreciate you all sticking with us. Check us out on podcast form, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Uh, subscribe to the Saints on NOLA.com YouTube channel. We'll have some giveaways later on in draft season, and we will be back on Friday, um, same time with a new draft podcast. Uh, you won't see Luke for a while. He's, he's headed on a vacation, but that's okay. We'll uh, we'll fill in with Jeff Duncan, which yeah, I mean, if my takes were worse today, it must be the the <laughs> it's seat. It's the seat you're sitting in. <laughs> definite, right. definite downgrade. Sorry, we'll, Dunk. We'll, we'll get Duncan here uh, on Friday, and uh, until then, we appreciate you watching. Leave in the comments below what you think of the Saints mock draft and um, how you would pick at 14 and 45 for Rod Walker, Luke Johnson, Matthew Paris, our producer Norman Bell. I'm Zach Ewing. Thanks for watching the Saints Insider.